When I was a child, I used to look up at the stars and wonder, where did it all begin? What's out there? And how's it going to end? I have to admit, I didn't think much about this planet. I just thought other people are taking care of that. When I was a teenager, I was thinking about studying physics and astrophysics at university. I was really lucky that a friend of my dad's worked at the University of Cambridge. We went to visit him. He took us punting on the river. We went back to his rooms overlooking the river and derived equations about the moon and the sea and the tides. And as we drove home, I just knew that's what I wanted to do. Fast forward 20 years, I was working in a big international team. We were finding out about the mysterious dark matter and dark energy that seemed to make up the majority of our universe. It was a really exciting time. Uh, this was the culmination of about 10 years of work on this project for many of us. And for me, it was the culmination of 20 years of research in cosmology. When we got our first results out, it was about the same time that my kids started at school. I felt that all my dreams had come true. But it was strange. Instead of feeling happy, I felt kind of empty and confused. and wondering what was the point of it all. Then I bumped into David Mackay, uh, who had taken me and Dad punting in Cambridge all those years ago. And he'd given me loads of fantastic advice ever since. He told me he had some health news. He said he had stomach cancer and just a few months to live. I felt the ground fall away from under my feet. A few months later, there was a meeting to celebrate his life, and he was able to be there. People came from all over, from his career as a world-leading physicist and computer scientist, and his from more recent career as um, somebody bringing science and rational discussion into the conversation about how to get off fossil fuels and how to address climate change. And people from all over kept talking about how David had helped them to figure things out for themselves, just as he had helped me. When he died, beyond the sadness, my previous emptiness and self-absorption seemed kind of boring, maybe embarrassing. I felt so lucky to be here. I feel like every day is a privilege. I feel lucky to have known David. And most of all, I feel I need to do something with that. I need to spend time trying to help make the world a better place for all our children. I needed to learn about climate change. It turns out that about a quarter of all climate change is from food. So that includes cutting down forests to clear land for agriculture. It includes putting fertilizer on the ground, whether that's uh, from manure or from chemical fertilizers. It includes livestock farming, it includes transport packaging, all the things it takes to get food onto our plates. And as we look ahead into the future, as we use less fossil fuels, the non-food part of this pie chart is getting smaller, which is fantastic. But at the same time, there are more people spending more money on food. And this red part of the pie, the food part of the pie, is getting bigger. And in 10, 20 years time, if we get off fossil fuels, food it's going to be the biggest contribution to climate change. 
So I needed to find out more. I thought, I'm going to Google the greenhouse gas emissions, the climate impact of what I ate yesterday. And this is pretty much what I found, uh, not a lot. Uh, and <laughs> three years later, I'd read hundreds of scientific articles and reports on how different foods contribute to climate change. And I'd figured out the answer to the question I had. I knew the greenhouse gas emissions of what I'd eaten that day three years ago. And so in this next few minutes, I'm going to just tell you the three most surprising things that I learned along the way. First of all, different foods have very different greenhouse gas emissions. If we take this example of an eight-ounce steak and uh, maybe some fries on the side with that, and a microwave potato and beans. It turns out that the steak dinner causes over 20 times as much climate impact as the beans and potato dinner. And that's mostly from the burps and manure from the cows. It turns out that cows burp about 5% of all the calories they eat out as methane, and cows eat about 40,000 calories a day. Now, when I give this talk, there's usually someone brave enough to put their hand up at the end and ask about beans. Uh, so I'm going to try to address the elephant in the room, as it were. Uh, and uh, it turns out that most people uh, don't fart methane, uh, and human flatulence uh, those people that do fart methane, it's not connected to whether they ate beans. <coughs> so it's not an issue for climate change, at least. Uh, okay, I uh, hope we've cleared that up. So uh, thinking about other food choices, uh, how about a sandwich? Um, we're going to go for a simpler sandwich than the delicious one looking here, over here. We're going to look at just bread, butter, and ham. How much greenhouse gas emissions do you think that causes? Um, it turns out that the ham causes most of the greenhouse gas emissions. We've put two slices of ham in here. It's about 50 grams of ham. Um, and that's mostly from growing food to feed to the pigs and also from manure uh, releasing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, nitrous oxide and methane. What if we switch to a different filling? How about a cheese sandwich? A lot of people are quite surprised that cheese uh, causes a similar amount of greenhouse gas emissions to ham. If anything, it could be slightly more, depending on how that's produced. Again, it takes about 10 kilos of milk to produce one kilo of cheese. Uh, so it's, again, the cows um, and the methane. If we had steak instead, so 50 grams of steak in a sandwich, uh, then that would be a bit more. But there are lots of other options uh, which would cause less greenhouse gas emissions. For example, uh, how about a peanut butter and jam sandwich? So the fact there are big differences between different foods means there's a lot of room for improvement. If all foods caused about the same amount of greenhouse gas emissions, there's not much we could do about it. The second surprising thing that I learned is that even for for one type of food, there's a range of greenhouse gas emissions, quite a big range. Let's take the example of an apple. Supposing we have an apple that's grown locally, uh, maybe somewhere in the UK. Uh, it's trucked across the UK uh, in a lorry. Uh, that causes quite a small amount of climate impact on the same scale as, as the other charts I'm showing you. You can hardly see it. But what if we ship that apple from New Zealand, from the other side of the world? Uh, how would that affect the climate impact? It turns out it makes very little difference. You can get a lot of apples on a ship, and the laws of physics tell us that when something like a ship is moving, it carries on moving. Um, on the other hand, what if, you, uh, what if you go to your local farm shop, uh, driving 10 miles down the road, uh, and supposing you stock up on 60 apples to keep you going. It turns out that actually causes more greenhouse gas emissions 
than shipping the apple all the way from New Zealand. So it's not always uh, what you might think, but at the same time, it's still relatively small, and, and before I get uh, lots of nasty um, emails from local farm shop owners, uh, you could uh, you know, have a nice day out and get a few more things, perhaps, uh, maybe combined trips and so on. Uh, so there's a lot we can do. However, when it comes to air transport, it's very different. Um, so if we take the example of some green beans, then these green beans uh, could be grown locally and produce relatively little greenhouse gas emissions. Or if they're flown in from another continent, they would, th this would really start to stack up, especially if we had our five a day like this. We need supermarkets to help us out here, I think. We could, we could ask supermarkets to label foods, maybe with an airplane sticker for things that have come by air or maybe, if that's too much to ask, a not airplane sticker on the fruit and veg that didn't come by air. The third surprising thing is that actually the foods that cause the greatest amount of greenhouse gas emissions also uh, use the most land. 80% of all the land that's used for agriculture is used to grow food to feed animals. Uh, on average, it takes 16 times as much land to grow 100 calories of animal-based foods uh, compared to 100 calories of plant-based foods. And in the extreme case, if the whole world went vegan, that means that we would free up three quarters of the land that's currently used for agriculture. I'm not suggesting that everyone's going to go vegan. It's a lot more complicated than that, as I've tried to, to illustrate. But this shows the huge power of what we eat. And if we can spare that land, we can use that land to grow trees or plant plants or other ways of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Those can suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and they can actually reverse climate change. So, what next? Who has the power here? I think that we as consumers have the biggest amount of power. That's why I'm here today to talk to you. We need to get off fossil fuels, but when we've done that, food is the biggest contributor to climate change. Because different foods contribute very different amounts of greenhouse gas emissions, that means there's a lot of scope to help. Broadly speaking, animal-based foods cause more climate impact than plant-based foods, but in detail, it's more complicated than that. This discussion is often pitched or cast as vegans versus farmers. That's really unhelpful. We can do better than that. We need to work together. We need to have a calm, rational, and informed conversation about how we're going to transform this food system. If I could ask you just one thing, it would be to demand labeling on all food packets to say the greenhouse gas emissions, the climate impact of those foods. That means we can make more informed decisions, but it also, equally importantly, recognizes all the good things that the food producers and farmers are doing to help reduce their climate impacts. We each hold the power every day, every meal we make choices about what to eat, and I really believe this has the key to, to fix climate change. When we choose lower emissions foods, then we use less land for agriculture. If we can use that land to grow plants, to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and if we can do that on a scale, huge scale, we can reverse climate change. And I can go back to looking at the stars. Thank you.